This is Kathy Hoffman. Uh, I'll go on camera here at nine, but just wanted to make sure that I give you an opportunity to get settled. So I'll check back with you in a few minutes. Thanks everyone. Good morning, everyone. This is Kathy Hoffman, the Policy and Rules Manager with the Liquor and Cannabis Board. Conversation from teams. <laughs> um, at, at any rate, uh, we will start promptly at 9.05. So again, thanks for joining us this morning and we're looking forward to hearing from you.
right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning for today's uh, listen and learn session on conceptual draft rules regarding the evaluation. Need to admit a few more people, so hoping that uh, everyone's able to join us on time this morning. But be that as it may, we're going to go ahead and get started with today's session. And let's see if this will load. There we go. All right. So uh, I know several of you have joined me for listen and learn sessions before, and you're familiar with what I'm about to present here, but I want to provide these um, uh, kind of an update, talk about our overall meeting goal uh, and purpose um, for those of you who may be new, and then just kind of sort of set the stage for us moving forward as we do this work together today. So um, our overall meeting goal today um, is to engage with all of you, our industry uh, partners and other interested partners to review draft conceptual rules that we've developed around the evaluation of THC compounds. And our intentions today are to share and discuss these draft conceptual rules concerning the, I'm sorry, concerning the evaluation of uh, THC compounds. We want to elicit feedback in a structured fashion, and then we'll discuss next steps at the end of the session. So why are we here today? Um, as you're probably all aware, the board began uh, to consider establishing a new rule section that would allow the LTB to evaluate additive solvents, ingredients, and compounds used in the production and processing of marijuana products other than Delta 9 THC, as well as CBD hemp or both, converted to Delta 8, Delta 9 THC, or any other marijuana compound that's not currently identified or defined in our, our revised code of Washington, um, in our WACs or administrative codes, or both, to determine whether these substances pose a risk to public health or use access. Our pre-proposal statement of inquiry was um, filed on July 7th, 2021. We did file a CR 101 prior to that, that was very limited in scope. And so we wanted to broaden the scope of this rulemaking. And so we refiled the CR 101 on July 7th. We've also hosted two deliberative dialogue sessions concerning uh, plant cannabis chemistry. The first of those was held on June 3rd the second on July 30th of this year. Notes and materials from those meetings are available on, on our external website. So happy to share the location of those with you towards the end of the session if you're interested. Crown noise. Um, so how will Decision makers. Um, the comments we received today will be added to an Excel workbook. Uh, it'll still be theme by theme, and then they'll be analyzed. Um, we will share these comments with the board for review and further discussion, and then we'll also share the workbook on the LCB website at a later date. So I want to go over meeting protocol really quickly. Um, I'll be the facilitator of this conversation today. Joining me are uh, LCB staff from Policy and Rules Program. Uh, with me is Jeff Kildall, our Policy and Rules Coordinator for Cannabis, Audrey Basic, our Policy and Rules Coordinator for Alcohol, and uh, Tierney Hamilton Steele, our very talented administrative assistant. And um, thanks for joining and helping with that today. Um, I wanted to call on Audrey and Jeff really quickly. Are there any tidbits of advice that you'd like to provide to our guests today about how to participate in this session? Such as raise hand features, those kinds of things. Hi, Kathy, this is Jeff. Um, throughout the uh, throughout the listen and learn session today, if you, if, um, if anyone has any questions, they can enter them into the 
chat function and I will be monitoring those um, questions and then I will um, I will um, raise my hand or or at a time where we have a pause in the presentation, I will um, read your questions out loud and or give you the option to unmute and um, speak during the session. All right, thanks very much. Is there any other technical pieces we need to share with folks so everyone can meaningfully participate? I don't have any others, Kathy. Okay, thanks very much, Jeff. All right, and I'm still admitting people, so I just want to uh, take a pause here and make sure that everyone who's trying to get in can get in. Uh, we have one gentleman we're having a hard time admitting, unfortunately. All right, so moving into uh, participant uh, roles, uh, when we do uh, come to the part of the meeting where we'll ask you to tell us what you like, what you don't like, and then offer uh, language that you think we should consider. So when we invite you to participate in this process. So very much looking forward to that part of the, the process. All right, so I want to talk briefly about our meeting protocol. I think, again, many of you who have joined us for these sessions are familiar with this. But for those of you who might be new, wanted to run through um, participant expectations. So just want to remind everyone this truly is a forum to share ideas and solutions and really not an opportunity to debate. I really invite everyone to appreciate the diversity of perspectives. We know there are many and we're looking forward to hearing those from you today. We invite everyone to stay on topic. And just as a reminder, the topic of the session this morning are these conceptual draft rules around THC compound evaluation. If you have questions or comments that you want to provide about other issues, please reach out to the policy and rules staff. We're happy to discuss those things with you. But again, we want to keep our, our conversation focused today on the set of draft conceptual rules around THC compound evaluation. to participate with intention today. Um, re maintain a, a respectful space, listen to and respect other points of view. And when you speak, please state your name and where you're from. We really encourage one person to speak at a time. I, at, at a time. I think this was a little more pertinent when we were live, but I think when we were in teams, there is that possibility to, for maybe two mics to be unmuted at the same time. Um, each person who raised their hand will be given an opportunity to speak. And we, we ask that you don't donate your time to other people. And then again, since this is a public forum, anything, shares has the, anything shared here has the potential to become part of a public record. All right, so how are we going to go through the rules this morning? Well. First, I'll introduce the topic. So that'll be a, a particular section of rule. People who raise their hands will be um, called on in the order of those hands were raised. Jeff will unmute you and um, give you an opportunity to speak. And then I'm not sure how many people are going to speak to each section of rule, but we'll try to stay within what we've allotted on the agenda. If it's a shorter amount of time, longer amount of time, um, we'll keep an eye on that moving forward. So when you are called upon to speak, um, please let us know what you like, what you don't like, and please offer alternative language for us to consider. It doesn't have to be in legalese. Uh, it can be conceptual, but we really encourage um, some uh, something that we can work with moving forward if there's things that we need to consider in terms of changing the draft conceptual rules. So thank you for being prepared to do that today. All right, so let's take a few moments here and in the chat box, I think that I saw someone already start to do that. Please share your name, who you're affiliated with, if you feel comfortable sharing that, and let us know why you're interested in the topic today. We'll give about three or four minutes for that to, to happen. So please, we're, we're anxious to hear from you.
And I need to go off camera just for one moment. I'll be right back. But it uh, uh, looks like people are introducing yourself. Let's keep that going. Thanks, folks. All right, so to keep us on track here, I'm going to move into the next session. That's, that's a very brief overview of the rolling process. I think in past listen and learn sessions, I've got a whole slide deck today. On slide. So um, if you have questions, additional questions beyond what I presented today, please don't hesitate to reach out to our staff to walk through the rulemaking process with you. But in a nutshell, uh, basic rulemaking process consists of three three phases. There's stage one, that's the pre-proposal statement of inquiry, and that's when an agency um, sort of notifies the public that they're considering developing rules on a particular topic. Uh, stage two consists of the proposed rulemaking, so that's where you see proposed rule text. Uh, CR 102 establishes a date and time for a public hearing, um, provides some other details about rules do, uh, purpose of the rulemaking, so on and so forth, and we offer proposed text at that time. And then the final stage is uh, the CR 103, or when the final rulemaking is presented. Uh, typically, rules become effective 31 days after that order is signed by a board, commission, or agency. Um, sometimes that uh, effective date is short for various reasons, sometimes it's longer. But those are, are basically the, the steps in the basic rulemaking process. So uh, if we were to look at that as a flow chart, um, again, here's the CR 101. Uh, stakeholder engagement happens um, after the CR 101 is filed, and that's where we are today. Um, there will be additional. Um, after the CR 102 is filed and the hearing date is set, uh, we accept formal public comment, so that triggers that process. Um, the agency uh, responds to those comments either by changing um, the proposal, the CR 102 proposal, and perhaps having a supplemental hearing, um, or if the changes do not change the substance of the rule, so the substantive comment of the content of the rule, we move into the CR 103 phase, and that's when the rules are finally uh, adopted. So again, we are in the very early stages of rulemaking. Uh, this is in between the CR 101 filing and the CR 102 proposal. And again, just a reminder, reach out to us if you have any other questions. So I'd like to move into um, actually discussing the content of the rule at this point. So I'd like to start with um, uh, our new WAC section that we're proposing. So that's 314.55.560 sub one. Um, and that's the purpose and scope of these this particular rule set. So let us know what you like, what you don't like, and again, suggested revisions. So I'll bring that text up on the screen. Uh, and put myself on mute, hand it over to Jeff, and we invite comments, feedback on this particular rule section. So Jeff, do we have any comments so far on this particular section of rule? Hi, Kathy. Not so far. I don't see any comments in the chat. Okay. I don't see I don't see any hands raised either. Okay. So we'll just give it another minute or two, just in case uh, someone is reading this for the first time, perhaps. So give it a couple more minutes. Thanks, folks.
So Jeff, it looks like we did receive a comment in the chat. Did you read yeah. that to, to maybe on the phone? Yes, I see the I see the comment uh, from AJ Sanders, a comment that reads recommendation to change marijuana to cannabis. Okay. Thanks for that. Any other comments, Jeff? So I see a comment from Ron Lewis, and the comment reads, if Delta-8 production is not allowed, I hope it is, but if it is not, then I hope it will uh, allow marijuana processors to purchase hemp for the sole purpose of extracting both putting it's it's rather lengthy putting both together okay. in the extraction putting both together in the extraction chamber to arrive at a natural drive concentrate with high thc from the marijuana and high cbd from the hemp this is not a Delta-8 conversion, but rather a useful way to combine the benefits of both hemp and marijuana together. That's the end of the comment. Thank you. So, Jeff, did we have any other comments concerning the purpose and scope of these rules? And and just this rules section, any, yeah. I thought I saw someone say, yeah. um, uh, let's see, establish a procedure for the board to evaluate additive solvents, ingredients, or compounds and used in the production of marijuana products. And the, um, uh, uh, pardon me, the suggestion was to strike the word and. I thought I saw that. Is that correct? I'm, I'm, I'm looking through here. It's, and again, we are, we for feedback on the on the actual rule text. So mm -hmm. go ahead. OK, I see a comment from Ron Lewis. Uh, the comment is I support the new whack on its surface. OK, thanks for that. And I, I see a comment from Micah Sherman. And the comment reads or it's a question is the purpose to evaluate or to evaluate and potentially prohibit? Is it useful to include the intent to limit or restrict inputs in the purpose and scope? Okay, That's so from those Mike, are questions. Go from ahead. Micah, from Micah Sherman. Okay. There's a uh, question from Sean Denae. And the question is, is the purpose and scopes intentions to create a pathway for converted cannabinoids into the system or not? Go ahead, Jeff. I didn't hear the, the rest of that. Uh, that's OK. I'll read it again. Is the purpose and okay. scopes intentions to create a pathway for converted cannabinoids into the system or not? Okay, so that was a question, but not a comment on that. The, okay, sorry. With respect to language or anything, right? Is that, I think, no, that's okay. I just want to make sure I was clear that that was a, a question rather than a comment. Okay. Yes, it was a question. And a, yeah. uh, okay. and, it, I'm, and a comment from Chris Gerard. I do not believe the LCB okay. should restrict you know, utilizing any cannabinoid in the production of cannabis products. Okay, appreciate that. Thank you. That's that's the last comment I see. Okay, so just want to uh, remind folks that um, these rules, this particular rules section, is based off of RCW 6953421M, that um, was part of House Bill 2826, I believe it was. Um, that was largely related to um, THC vapor products, but also created a, a, a way for the agency to establish a procedure, just as it says here, this is basically from the statute itself, um, to allow the board to evaluate additive solvents, ingredients, or compounds used in the production of marijuana products. 
Um, and we use the word marijuana because at this point in statute, we do have a definition for marijuana that's very specific. Um, we don't necessarily have a, mar a, a statutory definition for cannabis. So, um, all right. Any any other comments, uh, suggestions? I think we heard we need to remove the word and, I think. And there were some other um, other questions that were posed to us that I think we can take back to our group. group. Um, anything else, Jeff? Hi, Kathy, there is one one other comment from Chris Gerard. I do believe that dangerous additives should be regulated, but I am concerned about the breadth of the language and it being used to restrict cannabinoids. Okay, appreciate it. Thanks very much, Chris. All right, so let's do a time check here. All right, we are running a little ahead of, of, ahead of schedule. I think that's a good thing. That'll give us a little more time to work on the next session. So I'm gonna go ahead and move forward. Looks like comments have kind of slowed for this. So we'll move into the next section. And this has to do with uh, def a definitional section, section, excuse me, for um, some of the words that were used in statute, right? That we incorporated into this particular rule set that weren't defined in statute. So gives the board something to move forward with if they decide to do an evaluation of these kinds of um, substances. So again, we wanna hear what you like, what you don't like, and suggested revision. So I'm gonna bring up that rule text now. All right, and so uh, we're, we welcome your, um, again, your thoughts, your comments, your ideas, um, what you like, what you don't like. So Jeff, it looks like we have a hand raised for Luke. Okay, I, Luke, I will um, unmute you now for your question. Okay, go ahead, Luke. Go ahead, Luke. That looks like he's still muted, Jeff. I may be wrong, but. I uh, removed the mute. He's unmuted. Um, okay. Luke would, you, Luke, would you like to go ahead and um, type in your question if you're not able to use your microphone? Right, Jeff, were we not able to unmute Luke? Yeah, I, I unmuted him, but for some reason he, uh, we could not hear him. So I, I uh, hope he will enter his question into the chat and I'll try to continue to see if we can um, get him unmuted. Okay. Uh, are there comments in the chat that you can share with us? Okay. Uh, we have a question from Brad Douglas. Um, and his question is, 
regarding the definition of ingredient. Is the intention to include components of natural mix mixtures as well as intentional mixtures in this definition of ingredient? Well, that's a good question, Brad, and I think that's something we can um, take back to the team so we can define, really understand, or I shouldn't say really understand, but um, uh, sounds like we could come up with a more robust definition there. More specificity, I think, is what I'm hearing. Okay, and we have a comment from Jeremy Moberg, and his comment is, language like reason like reasonably be expected or otherwise affecting is too general for definitions additives should be more concisely defined such as quote anything added to a product unquote hey if you have some suggestions jeremy we'd love to see them so thanks very much for that if you have language you want to offer up for us to consider I'm um, happy to take a look at it. All right, other comments? Yeah, uh, we have a comment. Uh, just to clarify, hemp being distinguished from marijuana would be, quote, a non-marijuana additive. And that's a question. From okay. Kent, uh, from Chris Gerard. Okay. So some more concise definitions on non-marijuana additives. We have a question from Kent Hale, and the question is, can the WSLCB use the approved list for the food industry? Can, can can you give us a little more um, when you say approved list? Tell us what you mean there. Is there a way you can can speak to the group? Give us a little more clarity there. Approved solvent list. Okay, that's something we can take a look at. Thanks for yeah, that. We have a comment from Caitlin Ryan, um, and the comment is non marijuana gets tricky when there are so many questions regarding how or if hemp products outside the 502 system are allowed. It would be great to have definitions that delineate cannabinoids that come from inside the 502 system versus the hemp industry alone versus the hemp industry. Okay. Thanks for that, Caitlin. And there's a comment from Ron Lewis, and the comment is, I, I hope you will make consideration for the USDA rule that is currently in effect concerning hemp growers. If a hemp grower's hemp test result is over the allowed 0.3% THC limit, which is and in parentheses, not hemp, then the USDA and WSDA hemp program allows the hemp grower to grind up plants into a mix and offer to sale for processors. And I guess that's a question. There's a question mark at the end in parentheses. Okay. Okay. And All right. I, and I thought, oh, go ahead. No. Oh, Sorry. Uh, Another comment from Kent Hale. And the comment is an ingredient or additive should be restricted only to what remains in the final product. Okay. All right. And I thought I saw a comment from Sean Dene. Yes, I see that. Um, Sean's comment. Additive should be defined as, quote, anything added to a product, unquote, versus additives that otherwise um, affect the characteristics. Okay, thanks for that, Sean. Appreciate that uh, suggestion. All 
All right, just want to check with the group. Oh, go ahead, Jeff. Sorry. Oh, OK. There's. Um, there is a comment from Luke. And the comment is for section two. I think adding the text additive means any substance, the use of which results or may reasonably be expected to result directly or, or indirectly in its becoming a com component or otherwise affecting the somatic and psychological characteristics of any marijuana product on the consumer. And he further adds, adding the text, quote, somatic and psychological, unquote, I believe is more accurate. Okay. Appreciate that feedback. Um, and Kent Hale offers the comment, I, I believe in follow up. Let me. Uh, Jeff, are you still there? Yes. I kind of lost. Yes. I had to scroll back up. Um, oh, Kent's sorry. comment. <laughs> yeah, sorry, Kent's comment is uh, quote or his comment: an ingredient or additive. Oh, I'm, that's I think one we read already. Okay, here it is. His comment: approved solvent list from the food industry. So he's speaking of solvents, and he adds these yeah. products are known to be safe. And there's a comment from Jerry, Jeremy Moberg uh, asking or a question. Will synthetic be defined here? Uh, no, we're not defining synthetic here. Um, if you think we should define synthetic, we would be interested in um, uh, seeing something from you or maybe you want to bring up something today to uh, define synthetic. So open to hearing what you think. We, okay, we have a uh, suggested, uh, some suggested language from Luke. Um, his suggestion okay. is amending the text in 2D to read, quote, non-marijuana additive means a substance or a group of substances that are derived from a source other than the cannabis sativa plant. And he goes on okay. to add, he goes on to add, cannabis is not defined in statute. However, when referencing the quote, cannabis sativa plant, unquote, we are discussing the family of plants we use in our products and seems it would be adaptable with rule changes down the road. Okay. Thanks very much for that, Luke. Very helpful. All right, go ahead, Jeff. OK, and here's a comment from Drew Davis. I agree with Caitlin Ryan. Delta 8 isn't subject to all of the same restrictions as actual marijuana plants at this time. And can be imported from out of state, which is damaging to in state growers of marijuana and hemp alike. If Delta 8 is to be allowed, it needs to be regulated on equal footing as marijuana and should be required on product labeling if the THC isn't directly marijuana derived, or else your state marijuana growers will find their market crashing around them with an, a less regulated market driving prices considerably down. All right, so I see Sean would like to see a definition of synthetic here. So appreciate that, and thank you. Um, also would, again, appreciate uh, uh, 
any assistance that um, folks would like to offer up in defining synthetic. Uh, we would really appreciate that. We heard a lot in our deliberative dialogues to sort of ground where we might land on that, but really interested in hearing stakeholder feedback with respect to a definition of synthetic. And we do see some other comments um, asking for a definition of synthetic in the that in the in the chat. Audrey, Audrey, thank you for um, reminding folks that you can raise your hand to speak if you wish. Um, Jeff will unmute you. So uh, rather than having the conversation in the chat box, we do we do encourage um, folks to uh, share. Um, once they're unmuted. So that is an option. Okay. Anything else, Jeff? I'm uh, checking right now. Yeah, further comments, a comment from Sean Denae to add a definition of synthetic. We have a. I believe I. Oh, go ahead, Jeff. OK. We have a comment from Jeremy Moberg. As follows. Given that synthetics are not allowed by rule, it seems important that we define it somewhere in rule. There was a fair amount of debate regarding the term that seemed to prolong and confuse the implementation of the standing rules regarding synthetics. So, Jeff, um, I, I Maybe you cut out there. I didn't hear the remainder of, of Jeremy's comment. Oh, OK, uh, I'll read it again. I, I apologize. <laughs> okay. Given that okay. synthetic. OK, given that synthetics are not allowed by rule, it seems important that we define it somewhere in rule. There was a fair amount of debate regarding the term that seemed to prolong and confuse the implementation of the standing rules regarding synthetics, and that's the end. OK, and I thought I saw another comment from um, Ron Lewis. And Ron, I appreciate yeah. it. I, there was a comment you provided before I thought I saw in the chat that had to do with um, uh, LCB sort of working with WSDA. Some, go ahead. Do you see that comment, Jeff? Yes, I see a comment from Ron Lewis. Um, here it is. It's the comment is yes, label Delta 8 synthetic. Some consumers will care, others will not, and it will give I-502 growers a fair advantage when marketing their products. That's the end of his comment. Okay, and I'm, I'm going to scroll back myself. Here was the um, comment that uh, from Ron, let me read it again. So Ron, I just want to read this comment out loud. It says, perhaps the LCB could work with WSDA and USDA hemp programs to offer relief for hemp growers who accidentally, uh, and in parens, who got unavoidable outdoor sometimes grow. Uh, I'm sorry, hot hemp and provide a way for I-502 growers and processors to by that hot hemp. I want to make sure we, we spoke to that. And again, uh, we really do encourage folks to raise your hand and share opening openly. Um, happy to hear from you both in the chat and, and live as well. Okay, so there's a lot of, uh, uh, let's see. I see a lot of other comments in here. Um, Micah shares, I support the intent in the current definitions here to define non-marijuana additives, anything produced outside of the regulated marijuana market. 
Um, there's also a comment from, from Kent. Um, in the last session with science team, they articulated three buckets. Plant-based was not noted as synthetic and separate from artificial to which state law is intended. Um, and again, comments are really picking up here again. Um, Sean says, let's make sure that if hot hemp is grown, it is grown within the licensed canopy. Um, and then there's a comment from Christopher Gerard to uh, Ron Lewis. Uh, she took off. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. Creating an isomer via hyper degradation, as in heat, pH, and pressure that the plant can degrade to naturally is not by definition creating a synthetic. If so, converting a non psychoactive THCA to D9 is also creating a synthetic. No, so that was a question from Chris to Ron Lewis. And then um, Sarah Ross files um, offers LCB, I'm sorry, rules should give LCB ability to consider health and safety impact of solvents and additives on workforce and environment as well as consumer. Um, and in parens, what remains in the final product during evaluation. All right, and Jeremy Moberg's hand is raised. Go ahead, Jeff. Hi, Go can ahead. you hear me? Go yeah, go ahead, Jeremy. Yeah, I wanted to make sure that we were limiting the conversation to what is currently allowed by RCW. And hot hemp coming into 502 is currently disallowed. So I just wanted to make sure we weren't spending time talking about WAC related to issues that are not allowed by RCW. And also WAC that is currently um, not allowed by other WAC, such as there's standing rules for synthetics, they're not allowed. Clearly, we need a definition, but it'd be great to focus this conversation on aspects of the rules that are actually allowed by RCW and by current WAC. Appreciate that very much, Jeremy. Um, and I'd like to, I thought I saw um, Sean offer um, a definition of synthetic. So Sean, if I may, can we call on you to read that definition aloud to everyone? Would it be possible to raise your hand so Jeff can find you and you can read that definition to us all? Thanks, Sean. If you would, Jeff, please. Okay, Sean, go ahead. There we go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, Thank good. You, Sean. Yeah, while you all were talking, you know, I just looked up a quick Google search and, and the first thing that popped up is synthetic, um, um, a substance made by chemical synthesis, especially to imitate a natural product. They give the ex example as synthetic rubber. Okay. Thanks so I don't know if that, that would really cover it, but um, it seems simple enough. And uh, Delta-8 is certainly done in a chemical process to intimidate a natural product that the plant makes in small, minute quantities. So that might just cover us. Well, thank you very much for that. And, and it, it, it's a place to start. Appreciate the feedback very much and participation. All right, any other additional comments? And again, we are responding to this particular uh, draft conceptual rules section um, where we are defining the terms that the board might use and clearly that are offered in statute um, for the board to consider uh, when determining whether or not uh, uh, perhaps prohibit the entry of a substance into the system, or there's been a substance that's identified as a risk to public health or safety or use access. So really that's the scope of the, the board's authority here. Um, and that really is what we're trying to get at. All right, so I see another couple of written comments. Ron um, uh, offer some feedback. I understand it's not a traditional method of defining synthetic, 
that under these circumstances is beneficial to all involved parties. And then he offers it is synthetic in the sense that it is produced by synthesis, especially not of natural origin. And then there's a follow up from Chris Gerard. Um, can we place a definition for hemp derived additives? Any and all common, uh, compounds, pardon me, that are derived from industrial hemp that would assist in distinguishing non marijuana additive from hemp derived additive. I ask in an effort to clarify as rules change and as we incorporate all cannabis into our system. So thanks very much for that, Chris. And we will consider that. So great conversation. Uh, I really encourage more if there is some. Um, I see uh, Sean and Jeremy, your hands are still raised. Do you still wish to comment? Or uh, have you just not put your hands down yet? Just want to check in with you. All right, thank you. All right, so um, I just want to check in with folks. Uh, just wanted to check in and see where, if there were any comments that were offered in the chat that we did not read aloud. Uh, just want to make sure that everyone's being heard, <laughs> even if it's in the chat. Hey, we have a, Kathy, we have a comment from Jeremy Moberg. We need to make sure Hi. that we are, okay. We need to make sure that we are adhering to the intent of SB 2334, which was was to allow as an additive, allow as an additive to increase cannabidiol CBD content of a product and not allow for synthesis to other chemicals. So it looks and, like we have, uh, go ahead. Okay. And the, Comment from Drew Davis. The comment is most uses of the word synthetic apply to basic chemicals being altered. Synthetic oil for your car is still largely based on crude petroleum. Okay, thanks for that, Drew. All right, so it looks like comments have slowed a little bit for this. Um, so we'll give it another couple of minutes if there are any additional thoughts that folks think LCB should consider moving forward. Um, and it looks like we still have people joining in the conversation, so that's great. Great to see that. Looks like we just received another comment from Ron Lewis. And he says synthetically derived THC and naturally derived THC can be totally defined by LCB. And I think you might mean as applied to this topic. All right. So there's a couple of options here. Um, we do have a break scheduled for 10.05. Um, I think we're going a little, uh, we're about 10 minutes ahead of time, I think it's fair to say. So wondering if folks would like to, and raise your hand if you're okay with this, just continue to go through the rule set um, because we just have one more section to go. And then um, we can we can conclude the meeting a little early. I'm seeing a lot of hands going up. So are we okay going through? Feel free to take a a, a, a break as you need it. But um, I, I think I'm seeing uh, some support for just motoring through um, the last section of rule and, and perhaps ending a little earlier than than we have on the agenda. Um, everyone okay with that? So please raise your hand if you are. All right.
I, I appreciate the feedback. So I think I think we will go ahead um, and move forward again. If you need to step away for a few moments, no worries. We're still going to be on the, the last section of rule, and we will continue to um, invite feedback. Um, so thanks for that, everyone. All right, before we move on, Sean offers that, um, in quotes, hot hemp equals marijuana. So I'll just leave it there. All right, so we'll move into the next section. And that is draft conceptual rule section 314.55.560 sub 3, having to do with the procedure that the board would use to evaluate THC compounds. So let us know what you like, again, what you don't like, and suggested revision. And again, thanks, Jeremy, for uh, reminding um, our group here that we, we do need to really concentrate on this particular section of the rule and what it might mean. So moving forward. So again, we invite your, your comments, feedback, reactions, et cetera, to this particular section of the rule. Um, speaking to the procedure that the board can use to prohibit the use of any additive solvent ingredient or compound um, used in the production of marijuana products that may pose a risk to public health and youth access as well, including but not limited to. And so there's some um, things laid out there that would help um, that the board might use to make that kind of determination. So invite feedback. So, Brad, um, I see your hand raised. Did you wish to comment? And, and Jeff, if, if we could unmute Brad, please. Thank you. Okay, Brad, go ahead. Go ahead, Brad. So just as a reminder, again, this is the, the language that um, the board, or I'm sorry, the procedure really, and the associated language that the board uses um, to prohibit the use of any additive solvent ingredient or compound used in the production also of vapor products, um, vapor products containing THC. So, um, and, and again, this, this language is already in rule in a different section of rule um, that was uh, used for the, the prohibition of products that may be used in the production of THC vapor products. And Chris Gerard offers strike sub two, as we've seen this abuse many times, we should only be looking at the science not knee-jerk reactions of personally vested agencies. Remember being told using uh, marijuana would lower your IQ. That came from a federal agency. So thanks for that, Chris. Um, uh, Brad, are you able to unmute at all? Uh, Brad is unmuted, but I don't think he's able to uh, connect with his microphone. Okay, so perhaps Brad, if you could offer what you would like to share. There we go, audio issues. Um, Brad would like to suggest that a list of permitted ingredients also be maintained in addition to the prohibited ingredients. So thanks for that, Brad, appreciate that very much. Apologies for the audio issues. Are others with hands raised wishing to speak? It looks like there are three others. Is that correct, Jeff? Yes, I see three others. Uh, I'll uh, unmute Chris Gerard. So Chris, go ahead if you have a question or comment.
Go ahead, Chris. Apologies, I believe my hand was still raised from when we were deciding to take a break. Oh, OK, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. No problem. We have a. We have uh, Trey Reckling. With his hand raised, uh, I will go ahead and unmute Trey. OK, Trey, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Mine was the same situation. It was a vote for the um, regarding the break. Oh, okay. thank you, Trey. Thanks for voting, Trey. Appreciate it. All right, I did want to share a comment from Jeremy Moberg. Um, given the recent development on vaping at the federal level, it seems that sub two would need to stay in this section. So thanks for that. Um, Beth offers a comment for subsection D, uh, noting that at a minimum, allowing for additional review of prohibited substances if new science or relevant information becomes available. So thanks for that, Beth. Um, any other raised hands, Jeff, that weren't voting hands? <laughs> I, I think they were both voting hands and they're still raised, Trey and Brad. Okay, all right, no worries. Uh, we'll go ahead and, and uh, I'll wait for more comments. So. Looking forward to hearing from folks. Uh, Chris Gerard offers, please add to section B. Uh, this emergency rulemaking will only be deemed necessary if an immediate threat to public health and safety. I just want to reassure you, uh, Chris, that um, the statute that makes emergency rulemaking possible requires that the rulemaking be connected to uh, a threat to public health or safety. So I think we've got that covered, but I truly do appreciate your comment. Um, Jeremy Moberg asked the question, how will LCB track and enforce rules regarding use of ingredients and solvents or, or production of synthetics? Uh, we'll have to take that back to our rules team and discuss that. Unless there's someone from uh, enforcement on the line uh, that would be able to speak to that immediately. I, I believe we have a couple of uh, enforcement staff with us today. I mean, my guess, Jeremy, would be we would enforce and track in the way we have other products in the past. Uh, we've got a comment from Sean Dene, reply to M. Carter on we leave Delta 8 and other cannabinoids in the black market where our children have easier access to product. Uh, Delta 8 can be found in glass, CBD, tobacco, et cetera, stores, not just the unregulated market. Anything for human consumption needs to come from regulated plants and processes, in my opinion. Uh, another comment from Robin T. And this, uh, again, I, I really encourage folks to comment on the rules in front of us, but um, I'll read this comment from Robin. I think that non Delta 8 license holders should be able to sell Delta 8, can de generate jobs, wealth, capital for those who are pushed out or never got an opportunity to participate in recreational due to lack of opportunity. It can give people of color the opportunity to enter the cannabis industry. So thanks for that comment, Robin. Ron asked a question, is the board considering any production methods for Delta 8 THC? Again, Ron, um, we are considering these rules today. If you have questions like that, please don't hesitate to reach out to our staff. Um, and, and we're happy to walk you through where the agency, what the agency might be thinking. Um, again, a question from Michael Carter, sort of in the same vein, Michigan's regulating Delta 8, why are we not? Um, uh, 
I'll, I'll speak to that when we're done considering this particular rule section. Otherwise, Michael, I do invite you to reach out to me. I'm happy to describe uh, sort of the statutory construction around the I-502 market. Okay. So any further comments on this particular section of rule? Again, we are entertaining comment with respect to uh, the procedure for the board to evaluate these subjects. I thought I saw a hand go up. Hey, Kathy, I see a comment from Brad Douglas. Okay. Uh, I would like to, I would also like to suggest that the rationale for prohibiting permitting a substance or if substances are removed from their prohibited list be made a matter of public record. This would be akin to how FDA handles GRAS submissions for food ingredients. I'm not familiar with the acronym okay. GRAS submissions for food ingredients. Okay. Thanks for that comment, Brad. I really appreciate it. Uh, so Luke offers a comment generally in adoption. You oh, wait a minute. Sorry, the the, the whole comment. Uh, generally, an adoption of this new section of rule seems to be duplicative of some of the vapor rules in 314.55-550. Um, would there be any interest in removing language from 550 so we don't have duplicative rules in 314.55? Uh, further, it does not make sense to incorporate hardware into this section of rule and just fully remove 314.55-550 from the chapter since these two sections are so similar in their intent and inception. Um, uh, appreciate that comment, Luke, and it's something that we thought about, but because uh, the rules in 314.55.550 pertain to specifically to THC products, uh, mm -hmm. THC vapor products, um, and implement a specific piece of legislation, um, this made sense to us to make a distinction between the two. So appreciate the comment very much, but we will uh, take a look at that and see if there are similarities that we need to align. So very much appreciate that substantive comment. Jeff, it looks like we have a hand raised. Yes, uh, Jeremy Moberg has his hand up. So uh, okay. uh, go ahead, Jeremy. Uh, hi, I actually just typed it into the comments, but um, I think okay. that the in this next round of rulemaking, uh, it should be really clear what the pipeline, and we've seen this in the thread comments thread multiple times here, and we've seen how disruptive uh, hemp into the uh, 502 regulated market can be. And I think that it should be clearly stated in rule that uh, the in, that the legislative intent and the law itself restricts the importation of hemp into 502 as a CBD additive only. Um, I think that needs to be very clearly spelled out. Okay, thanks for that comment, Jeremy. Appreciate it. All right, and Chris Bradley asked a question. Uh, this section, so 314.55.560 sub 3 suggests that the only basis for a board prohibition of additive solvent, et cetera, to marijuana products. Um, and then it says public health criteria. So I think what you mean, Chris, is um, uh, would this prohibition be related to um, a, a public health incident? And again, going back to the statutory authority that gave us gave the agency the authority to put these rules forward, um, very specifically says that the board may only prohibit these substances um, uh, if there is a public health um, instance or incident or to uh, address youth access issues. So, statute is very specific about um, 
the what the agency can and cannot do in this space. If you'd like to reach out to me and have a conversation about that, happy to do that with you. But that's a great question. Appreciate it very much. All right, and I see some additional um, comments that uh, don't really pertain to this section of rules, so I'm not I'm not going to read those aloud. Um, just try to keep us uh, focused on this particular section. All right. So um, uh, last call. Uh, oh, Sarah uh, Ross Viles. Jeff, may we unmute Sarah, please? Yes, I'm. Uh, I'll uh, unmute Sarah. Okay, Sarah, go ahead. Thank you. I put this in the chat, but I I didn't hear it, so sorry if I missed it. Um, wondering no, if it <clears throat> makes sense to spell out uh, youth access as public health, as well as public health. Um, and other folks have been highlighting that this is very similar to the vapor laws. So just wanting to make sure that a definition of youth access wouldn't be limited to vapor ingredients, if that were to be added. Very, very helpful. Thank you for that. And uh, Jeremy Moberg has. So, uh, Jeff, I think you cut out there, at least on my end. Can can you say that again? Oh, sorry. Uh, Jeremy Moberg still has his hand raised. Jeremy, do you uh, do you have a question? Okay. He 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 um, lowered his hand. All right. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, any other um, any other comment with respect to subsection three? I'll give it about another minute. Okay. Just want to circle back with folks. Uh, oh, here's another comment from Sean. Section three needs to also include allowance for a recall of products. We do have a rule that addresses that, Sean. Um, I really appreciate you bringing that up. And, and yes, we already do have a, a rule that uh, concerns recall of products. So appreciate that. Uh, looks like Micah Sherman raised his hand, Jeff. Okay, go ahead, Micah. Go ahead, Micah. I think he lowered his hand. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Micah. Uh, Sarah, did you have any follow-up? I see your hand is raised. I just wanted to make sure we circled back to you. Okay, thanks, Sarah. Okay, Micah, go ahead. We're not able to hear you, Micah. Unfortunately. Mike, if, uh, um, okay. And also, um, if you want to put what you're thinking in the chat, Mike, I'm ha happy to read it aloud to everyone um, if, if you feel compelled to do that. Otherwise, maybe we can connect a little later and you can let me know what you were thinking. All right, so it looks like comments have slowed down. Um, and again, we are running about 45 minutes ahead of time. So um, thanks for the great conversation and appreciate the feedback on the rules, uh, the draft conceptual rules. So again, we'll give it another minute and then move on.
And Micah's feedback to us is, and I'll read it, Micah, why do we not start from a place where the only thing that things that are allowed are things that are approved ahead of time? That's something we'll consider uh, when we go back to our work group. All right, there was another question, uh, comment from Michael Carter that did not pertain to the rule in front of us right now. So we'll go ahead and leave that there. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and move to the next slide, which really is wrapping up and talking about next steps. So for folks that have joined us in this process before, uh, we'll take all of the data that was called here today that you offered us in terms of feedback on these rules. Um, Analyze it by theme. Of course, I, I think I saw a number of themes emerge here today. Um, and then we'll take that back to um, the board to discuss with them and to our internal work group as well. A couple of things could happen from here. Some of that feedback may be incorporated into a rule proposal in the future. At this point, we're looking at moving to a rule proposal at the end of this month. Um, based on this feedback, we may need to push that out by a couple of weeks if we need to do additional review and uh, consideration. Um, and then, as I shared in the earlier part of the, the session here, uh, the 102 would be filed. We are guesstimating again, I don't know if guesstimating is the right word, but we are assuming uh, either the end of this month or uh, uh, mid-October. Um, and that would set the date for the public hearing. And then we begin receiving formal comments. So the comments you provided to us today are very helpful in rule development. Um, they are not considered formal comments. However, um, as part of the Sierra 102 packet, uh, we always include the comments from these listen and learn sessions so that anyone who reads that rule package um, will understand sort of the course of the conversation that uh, happened during the, the course of rule development because that's very important um, a part of the rule development process. So with that, I want to check in with my team here, Jeff, Audrey, um, anything you'd like to add in closing? No, I don't think I have anything, Kathy. Thank you, Jeff. Um, Audrey. All right. Nothing to add for me. Thanks for. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Nothing to add for me, but oh, thank no. you everyone for participating. Yeah. I would like to echo that. Um, also, want to encourage people to keep an eye out um, on our outward facing webpage. Um, it takes us a little longer, I believe. Audrey, correct me if I'm wrong here. It takes us a little longer to get recordings of these sessions up on our outward facing web page than it did with WebEx. Be that as it may, we will have this uh, recording uploaded to the, the session, I'm sorry, to the web page um, in the next few days. And then we'll also share our comment table um, that we put together from this whole session as well. So with that, I'd like to really, really thank everyone for joining us here today. Um, great conversation. We appreciate all the meaningful feedback pertaining to the rules section. And uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you on this very important topic uh, in the coming months. With that, I'd like to close the session. Thank you everyone for joining us. Have a great day.